Matthew Bell with Alzheimer'sProof.com, and today I'm going to follow up the video that I did just a few days ago on the 23andMe. I finally got around to producing the video where I talk through my submission of a genetic sample to 23andMe, the genetic testing company. And in this video, I thought I would look at some of the results that I received that are relevant specifically to Alzheimer's disease. So just a couple of caveats. I am not a healthcare professional. I'm not a doctor. I don't have any special insight or expertise in genetics or medicine or any of those things. All this is is simply my experience with 23andMe and me sharing some of the results that I have in the hopes that we can kind of use those results in order to have a more general conversation about genetic risk as it pertains to Alzheimer's disease. So I realize that my specific genetic results are probably only interesting to me and to my immediate family, but the reason that I'm bringing myself into this is simply to use my results as a springboard for a more general conversation. According to the current state of the science, certain genes raise a person's probability of getting Alzheimer's disease or developing Alzheimer's disease, at least at some point in their life. It's important to realize from the get-go that genetic risk is only one component of the overall risk profile that a person's going to have in terms of Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. And I will kind of draw your attention to one of the first videos that I did on the actual risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, and there's a number of these. Age is going to be the preeminent risk factor. The older you are, the more likely it is that you're going to have Alzheimer's disease or develop it. Sex is also a risk factor. There are other conditions that might also predispose a person to Alzheimer's disease, and we'll get into a couple of those. And I've gotten into a couple of those in other videos. A few, just to, to name them, would be cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, Down syndrome. And of course, I'll remind you that this is the second part of a series on my experience with 23andMe, and I have a previous video if you'd like to see the steps that I went through to collect the sample and to actually submit it to 23andMe. Now in this case, Alzheimer's disease is specifically associated with one particular variant, or I should say late onset Alzheimer's disease is specifically associated with one particular genetic variant. Now in previous videos, I've referred to this as APOE, or in specific, the APOE4 variant. I had the opportunity subsequently to view a video from 23andMe. They have a short video from a scientist. He actually pronounces it APOE4. So whether it's APOE or APOE, I mean, it's referring to the same thing. I'll put it on the screen. There's actually three variants, but not all of them are associated with increased risk, as you can see. So the APOE2 variant actually is supposed to reduce risk. This is the least common variant. The APOE3 appears to have no effect, and APOE4 is associated with a slightly increased risk of late-onset dementia, late-onset Alzheimer's disease. Scientists supposedly don't know presently exactly how this APOE gene actually causes Alzheimer's or increases its risk. They don't understand the dynamic. And again, the cause of Alzheimer's is a more detailed conversation. At the present time, there is no one definitive description or understanding of how Alzheimer's disease is caused. For that information, I actually have a video where I go through some of the hypothetical causes or some of the candidate causes for Alzheimer's disease. And of course, as we said, there are other risk factors. High blood pressure would be one. High cholesterol would be one. Type 2 diabetes is another. Family history is very important. So going into the test, I realized that my dad and on my mom's side, my grandmother, both had diagnoses of Alzheimer's disease. My dad, of course, died of Alzheimer's disease in 2016. My grandma, who passed this past June in 2019, she died with Alzheimer's, even though she didn't die from it directly. So I was pretty well understanding that I've had Alzheimer's disease on both sides of the family. So in general, the 23andMe procedure for disclosing the results, they have a number of tutorials and they want you to understand that there are more factors that go into your risk for Alzheimer's than just genetic factors. So there are genetic factors and then there are non-genetic factors. They want you to understand that you might be able to moderate and control your risk to a certain degree or even lower it in virtue of certain lifestyle choices and factors. That is maintaining heart health. Diet is one aspect of that. I get into the mind diet in other places. 
This is going to include things like eating green leafy vegetables and fruits and whole grains, healthy fats, and so on. There are plenty of resources that I have on alzheimersproof.com and other videos that I've produced on this channel that get into that a little more. Keeping active, being physically active, being mentally active. I have other videos where I talk about different brain and mental exercises. I have a series planned in terms of physical exercise to help people to understand that maintaining a active physical lifestyle doesn't necessarily have to be very strenuous. It could include things just as simple as walking, but I do get a little bit more into exercise and things like that, at least from the content that I have planned. And then things that you can do, reading, learning new language, learning musical instrument, I get into these in other places as well. Finally, 23andMe wants customers to understand that their genetic tests don't constitute a diagnosis. So nothing that 23andMe discloses to anybody is supposed to constitute a diagnosis of any condition. It is simply a genetic predisposition based upon the current state of the science. And even in that case, the genetic predispositions that we're talking about here generally are, for the most part, fairly slightly increased risk. So according to the information that I viewed on 23andMe, for the general population by age 85, if you live to age 85, you've got about an 11 to 14% chance of developing late onset Alzheimer's disease. That's just general population statistics. For my own genetic profile, my risk is slightly increased. We'll get into that in just a minute. So by age 85, for my genetic profile, they put my risk at between 20 and 30% by age 85. So that means out of 100 people who have my similar genetic profile in this way, who make it to age 85, 70 to 80 of them will not have Alzheimer's disease, and 20 to 30 of them will develop it. But if you look just one decade earlier at age 75, they're quick to point out that even with my genetic profile, the risk is only 4 to 7 percent, meaning that 93 to 96 people out of 100 will not develop late onset Alzheimer's disease by age 75, even with the genetic mix that I have. And once again, they, they stress and emphasize that overall risk is going to be a function of genetic risk and non-genetic factors. Now, in my case, presumably I have additional factors that are relevant. So, for example, my dad having had the disease makes it the case that I have a family history that maybe other people wouldn't have. So, coming at this just from the standpoint of the genetic result without knowing what I know about my dad's situation, maybe that changes things a little bit and maybe bumps my risk up just a tad. But let's actually get into the results. So I thought I would just walk you through the actual process of receiving the report and tell you a little bit about what my results were in an effort to kind of jumpstart a little bit more of a conversation about what the results imply. So choose health reports. When you log in, they, once again, we went through this in terms of the submission of the actual sample. You had to select, you had to opt in to various testing procedures, but here, just to make sure you're completely on the same page, they basically talk about, would you like to actually receive the report that was generated? And it sounds funny that you would actually ask them to generate the report, but you don't want to receive it. But you can see here that they caution you that the reports do not diagnose any health conditions and results should not be used to make medical decisions. And then they ask, would you like to receive the report? And then you either click that you do or you don't. Of course, I opted in. Then you're brought to another screen here where it says you choose the health report that you're actually going to be looking at. So some of the health reports in include information that might not have a cure, Alzheimer's being one, and then it asks you to evaluate yourself in terms of whether or not you feel anxiety or depression over these things and to make a good choice about whether or not you want to actually receive this information. Furthermore, as we went through in some of the terms and conditions, you see that there are a couple of cautionary notes the middle one there, knowing or telling others about your genetic risk could affect your ability to get some kinds of insurance. Having a risk variant does not mean you will definitely develop the condition. And even if no variant was detected in the relevant sense, you could still have a variant that hasn't been tested for, and you still might end up with a condition even if this particular test indicates that based on one or a couple of genetic factors, your risk seems to be a little bit lower statistically. I mean, it's just like you know, a day when there's only a 25% chance of rain, it could still rain, even though the chance of rain is lower on some standard or other for evaluating that, it could still rain. And then it mentions here, genetic testing for these conditions in the general population is not currently recommended by any healthcare professional organizations. 
and then it singles out the Alzheimer's Association as a pa patient advocacy group that does not re recommend genetic testing for Alzheimer's disease in the general population. And then again, you see here, out of all of the conditions, Parkinson's, cancer genes, some other stuff, you, you have late onset Alzheimer's disease report. And if you click on learn more, then you see a little pop-up box here and it says late onset Alzheimer's disease usually develops after the age of 65. It gives a little synopsis of the symptoms, memory loss, mood changes, and so on. And then it says consider the following when deciding whether or not to view this report. There is currently no cure for Alzheimer's. The report does not cover all variants that may be associated with the disease. We're still, you know, in an infant stage really learning about the disease. And then it says the risk variant for this condition is common. Depending on ethnicity, about 15 to 40 percent of people are expected to have at least one copy of the variant. And the genetic result with the highest risk is associated with up to a 60 percent chance of developing Alzheimer's disease by the age of 85. But there are other factors that influence your total risk. That includes family history, lifestyle, and ethnicity. And then you get to choose yes, no, or ask me later. And of course, for that, I clicked yes. I'm going to block out all the information that is not relevant to the Alzheimer's report. So then you're brought to a screen where you get to talk, where you get to sort of dive into the results. And you can see it, that includes health results based on DNA. You can see health off to the side. And when you click it, or start with health and traits. You can start with either of those two. You're brought to a different screen here. Health disposition, late onset Alzheimer's disease. It kind of gives you a synopsis at a glance. You can see that my result was that I have a slightly increased risk. You can see it. And it's, again, they're, they're constantly layering this with cautionary words. Keep in mind, these reports do not include all possible genetic variants. Other factors can influence whether or not you end up with a condition and then you will notice though that this is a hyperlink and you can click on it and when you get your report and it'll bring you to this screen. So here, late onset Alzheimer's disease, I have one copy of the E4 variant that was being tested for. So the APOE or APO E4 gene, I have one variant, which predisposes me slightly to late onset Alzheimer's disease. But notice that another factor is going to be family history, which I also have. They characterize it again. You can see here many factors, including genetics, can influence your overall chances, and they want to make sh sure, double sure, triple sure, quadruple sure that you realize that. Then you can see the result highlighted. Now here we see people with this variant have a slightly increased risk of developing late onset Alzheimer's disease. So I noticed there are three actual possible results. And here, you know, they, they bring you to a screen. Of course, there's there's really a lot of information, but you can see there that a person, it says studies estimate that on average, a man of European descent, which I mostly am with this variant, has a four to seven percent chance of developing late onset dementia, Alzheimer's disease by age 75, and a 20 to 23 percent chance of developing it by age 85. So you can see, once again, this test does not diagnose Alzheimer's disease. And there are certain limitations. For example, it does not include all possible variants or genes. It doesn't test for everything, even those that are associated with late onset. Maybe they're not even aware of all of those that it, there could be. So it doesn't test for all of them. And then furthermore, it does not include any genes that could be linked to early onset Alzheimer's disease. And it does not determine your full APOE or APO genotype. So this was my result, and there was a video, and this is the transcript of that video that kind of helps you to dive into it, and I'll pretty much leave it with this, but it says it, I had one copy of the E4 variant, and then down in the little box it said, based on that result, more than 25% of people also have that result, but we have a slightly increased risk of developing late onset Alzheimer's disease in virtue of that. So it says for the general population, about 11 to 14% of people may develop Alzheimer's disease by the age of 85. But with my result, it's possibly 20 to 30%. So roughly double. But by age 85, if you look at the disease risk up to age 75, the risk is 4 to 7%. So that means that out of 100 people, 93 to 96 are not expected to develop Alzheimer's, even with this result. Now I should say that there are other results, obviously, you could have, according to the brief investigation that I did, it looks like you could have zero copies or two copies. Those are the other two possible results. So if you have zero copies of the E4 variant, this is the transcript you would read. 
and it says this E4 variant was not detected in your DNA, thus you do not have an increased genetic risk associated with it, but it doesn't mean that your risk is zero because many other factors can influence risk. It says in general, people with this result, five to 10% may develop Alzheimer's by age 85. So remember, in the general population, it's at 11 to 14. So if you have no variant, then your risk with all other things being equal is gauged to be about five to 10%. So that means out of every 100 people who live to 85, five to 10 are expected to develop the condition with this genetic profile. The other profile option would be two copies. And this is the one where your situation is a little bit worse off from a statistical point of view. And this is where you would include this higher risk. So it says people who have two copies even though the general population, again, is 11 to 14% by age 85 who develop Alzheimer's, for people with two copies of this APOE4 variant, it is estimated that up to 50 to 60% may develop Alzheimer's by the age of 85. But at the age of 75, the risk is 28%. It's still higher, but you've got to realize that that still means that out of 100 people, 72 people are not expected to develop Alzheimer's by age 75. So, to put some of these in perspective, I just think of a meteorological example. Again, if you're thinking about what are the chances of rain and the forecaster says 100% chance of rain, you know it's gonna rain. But if they say you have a 28% chance of rain, that means that it's more likely it's not gonna rain. So even in the case of up to age 75 with this result, 28% developing it by age 75, that means 72% are still not going to develop it. And even if you look ahead to age 85, 50 to 60%, I mean, obviously that's better than even chance or even chance, but you still think an even chance that is one out of every two people, even with this result, are still not going to have Alzheimer's by age 85. So given that, I mean, genetic, I'm not a genetic determinist and the report is very heavily hinting that they're not pushing any kind of genetic determinism on you. They're not saying this is the result you're gonna see because they acknowledge that there are other risk factors and even ways of mitigating your risk. So, and they, they advocate again, keeping your heart healthy, eating green leafy vegetables. So we get into the mind diet and other videos, exercise, both physical and mental and, and other things. So, but these are the possible results. My result, of course, was that I had one variant, so my risk is slightly elevated over the general population, but uh, I kind of walked you through there the other two possibilities as far as I could determine. I will leave it with that. So I thank you so much for being with me today. I hope that something that I shared was of interest to you or of help to you. If it was, I ask that you click the subscribe button, click the like button. I ask that you click the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. I thank you so much for being with me today. I look forward to seeing you again in another video. And if you choose to participate in 23andMe or in some other genetic testing, I wish you the best with your results, and I hope that they are enlightening to you rather than vexing. Thank you so much.